so I think it's absolutely essential to explain to the to the general public what we're doing and in particular to try and capture their imagination with the kind of exciting things that are going on in the CRG. A lot of basic science is, is happening in the CRG that will be essential for the future of medicine. I mean, I think the future uh, kind of health benefits of, of science depend on understanding how biology works at the moment. And that's why we have to do this kind of work. And that's why we have to explain and make it clear to the general public why it's so important to do this kind of work. And that basic question of biology is what you see here, is how we are created as uh, organisms during development from a single cell. Since I'm going to really focus on the scientific aspect, I'm not going to talk much about the applications of this work, so I'm just going to mention very briefly now one, one feature, which is there are some kinds of animals, unlike ourselves, who, if they're damaged, are able to completely regrow their entire arm. This is a, a simulation of a salamander, a kind of amphibian, which, after its arm has been cut off, you'll see that the cells in the remaining part of the limb, they start moving, they start uh, changing the different colors, I mean, they, they're doing different things, they're turning into different cell types, like muscle and bone, and they rebuild the entire arm. Of course, humans <coughs> cannot do that, but if we can understand more about really how the body works, we should be able to improve at least our ability to heal our bodies when things go well. The talk is gonna be split into three parts. So the, the three flags that I've chosen, you will see why they've been chosen as we go along. And we're going to ask three questions. One, how does an embryo develop? Secondly, what are genes? And thirdly is the question of self-organization and self-organizing systems. Across these chapters is also a kind of a story of a, of a debate. And it's a debate between two alternative ideas, alternative explanations of how our bodies are built. And these two people, Lewis Wolpert and Alan Turing, were the originators of these two ideas. These are both um, British scientists. One was an engineer who became a biologist, and one is a mathematician. The ideas that they proposed were seen as alternative explanations for the same thing. The question that we should be able to answer at the end is why is it that it's actually very common in humans and, and other animals to have multiple fingers, but it's extremely uncommon to have multiple arms. So the first chapter, it's called the French flag problem, and it's essentially the question of how does an embryo develop. And this is the, the magic of morphogenesis. Morphogenesis is simply the scientific word for this process. This particular example is a zebrafish, and you can see that over a very short period of time, you can see the minutes going by. This is an embryo that's been filmed in a dish, turning from a little collection of cells into an organized structure. Your body, our bodies, are made of different tissues. Of course, we have different organs in different places. So we have nervous tissue, we have muscle tissue in different places. The tissues are all made of cells. And a cell looks something like this. It's a complicated structure, and we don't have to know much about what's inside. They're very, very small. How many cells do you have in your body? Something in the order of 10 million million cells. But what we're more interested in here is how many different cell types you have, not how many cells you have. In fact, in the body, it's typically recognized that we have about 300 different cell types. All your different cell types, they all came from one original cell. And the key thing for developmental biologists is that cells in different places during this process will produce different parts of the body. But let's just watch this again, now thinking about cells, the fact that this is simply a big collection of cells that at this point have not created any, any obvious structure. The cells are running around and they're turning into different things. Here some cells turned into an eye, here some cells turned into a muscle, here they turned into the spine in the back. And how did they know to, how to do that? The basic question is to go from that group of cells to this embryo, we start with a group of cells that are all the same and somehow have to say, okay, the cells on this end will become the head cells. The ones in the middle will become the body. The ones at the other end, the tail. And if we take such a simple example and just to give the different cell types different colors to illustrate this idea, then you see where the idea of the French flag comes from. 
It's simply a very simplified and abstract uh, way of presenting the question. That is the French flag problem, and it was in fact first explicitly proposed as a way of trying to understand things um, in 1968. So what was his proposal? We have our row of cells, they're starting all the same, they have to get three different colors. Actually one of the cells, or some of the cells, are already different. And these cells are going to produce some kind of substance which will then move, will then diffuse through the rest. In all the subsequent diagrams, I will show it more as a, as a graph. So here we have space, and here we have the concentration of this substance. And the word morphogen had already been proposed, but this was the, the use that became very popular since the 60s onwards. A substance which diffuses, has different concentrations, and allows then the cells to make the right choice. The cells here, are going to magically turn into the right cell type, the blue ones, the white ones, and the red ones. The question then is what sort of calculation, as it were, is each cell doing? If M is our concentration of uh, this morphogen, then a cell should become blue if it senses, if it detects more than a certain amount of M. If the cell detects more than a lower amount, then it would become white, and if it doesn't make either of those two choices, maybe the default choice is to stay being red. A lot of support for this came from some specific experiments done by another scientist. This is John Saunders. What he studied was the chicken embryo. They take a few cells from one place and put it in another place and see what happens. Now what he discovered over a long period of decades was a very amazing thing. This is the normal situation and this is a diagram showing this little bud. This is a limb bud. So it's there are lots of cells in here, and it's these cells which are going to make the decisions about what to become, to become bone, to become muscles, to become whatever. Now what he discovered is that if you took some cells from one side and transplanted them and put them on the anterior side, instead of getting a normal wing, you actually get six fingers. He discovered that the, the new extra three fingers were not just in any order. They were specifically a mirror image duplication. So you have Four, three, two, and then you have two, three, four. If you look at it, if you looked at a graph of this, it could look something like this, with high levels on this side and low levels on this side. So digit four, maybe, is occurs because you have high levels of M, and digit three occurs because you have medium levels, and digit two because you have low levels. In the 90s, after molecular biology had come along and we were finding genes, uh, in fact, a gene was found which produces a protein in specifically these cells, and this protein can diffuse, can move through the tissue as predicted by the model. So, how about the other flags and the other questions? What are genes? If a cell's calculations, what it has to do, are a bit like a computer program, how does a computer follow a program like this? A computer has an electronic circuit, lots and lots of little switches. These switches, they're wired together in a specific way, and by wiring many switches together, you create an electronic circuit. Going back to the biology, genes are stretches of DNA. You may or may not also know that for every gene, there is a protein that is produced. A gene can be on or off. It can be kind of switched on or off. Again, a long time ago, in the 60s, it gradually became apparent that there are, in a way, two different kinds of genes. There are structural genes, but there's a subset of genes which gradually became clear have a very specific, interesting role. Rather than going and building you, building your skin, building your bones, building you, these proteins actually go back and switch on or off other genes. So in fact, all these genes are essentially switches. It did become speculated from the 60s and 70s that genes, or at least a subset of genes, could also act like um, a control network. Now, why the Spanish flag for this bit? One of the major goals in my lab is to understand the relationship between a network like this and what it actually achieves. Rather than having a system where you get three different cell types, we chose a system where you get only two cell types. The question is how you design these networks to create the, the pattern that you want, in this case the Spanish flag. This is part of the ongoing work in the lab. Explore hundreds and thousands of different designs of gene networks that are like a little electronic circuits to see which ones are capable 
are capable of actually making a stripe. So we've understood now that embryos could be built using this idea of a morphogen and a gradient in the French flag model. The, the way that the cells have a kind of program or a circuit to allow them to make these decisions is because their genes act like switches and are wired together into a kind of a network. So what about the last bit, self-organization? This is due to this second scientist that I mentioned, called Alan Turing. So he was an English mathematician. He invented the concept of a Turing machine, and then he in later invented the idea of a universal Turing machine. These concepts actually became the founda foundations of the computer. In the UK, he was also extremely um, important. It's even sometimes exaggerated to the extent that he, he won the war against the Nazis. In addition to that, as if that wasn't enough, he's also had major inputs into the field of artificial intelligence. One of the last things that he did was he got interested in the question I've just been telling you about, which is developmental biology. To give you a flavor of what he managed to show, I'm going to show you this picture of uh, sand. Now in this picture, the sand looks very flat, but we all know that in fact sometimes sand ends up forming these kind of ridges. If you actually stop and think for a moment why should sand form these ridges just because wind is blowing across it, so you only then realize that it's not easy to understand why it would form these ridges. There's nothing specific telling it to make ridges like this, it's just the wind blowing. It turns out that the way this happens is, uh, is what's called an example of self-organization. It's a self-organizing system. Alan Turing was the, the first person to work out a simple mathematical um, description of a kind of system which does this. Which is to say, if we imagine again our circuits, our gene networks, he discovered that a very, very simple gene network of just two of these switches wired together in the right way could spontaneously self-organize. We have to remember that this same simple little circuit is in multiple cells that are all next to each other. What happens if you set this up in the right way is a bit similar to the sand dunes, which is to say there's no global control um, onto the system. It just spontaneously starts to produce stripes like this stripes of gene expression in, in this case. Now it's been thought for a long time that this is indeed the explanation for stripy patterns like the ones seen on zebra. The question though is whether it could be responsible for a pattern like this. Our fingers are essentially a stripy pattern. What happened is that there were these two alternative ideas therefore about how our cells in our body are organizing themselves to produce the shape of our fingers. One French flag model, and the second one I would now call the Catalan flag model. So the French flag model was more like a regionalization, it was to say how can you make different regions different from each other. Whereas when you make something like your fingers, you're not really making different regions, you're just making a stripy pattern. These two guys themselves were not f fighting about this, but people in the field argued a lot. Jumping forwards a long way, some collaborators of ours who work in um, Santander in the University of Cantabria. They were essentially mutating different genes in this kind of control network of switches that's believed to be involved in controlling the system. And what they uncovered was an absolutely amazing array of, uh, of, of results, of limb shapes. In these mice, which are mammals like ourselves, altering a few genes in specific ways, you can see here that you get huge numbers of fingers forming during development. The fact that you get so many fingers, and also another fact, which is that the, the size of these digits is getting thinner and thinner as you go from here to here. This has made it extremely uh, strong evidence that the Turing mechanism must be right. And just to emphasize again, I think what you, can, you can see that when you get up to so many fingers, um, it really does start to look just like a repeated pattern like sand dunes or various other things. So, wrapping up towards the end, just to emphasize why the Catalan flag seems to be an exceptionally good analogy for producing fingers. I'm sure many of you know the, the legends as to how the flag was created. That this um, fantastically named Wilfred the Hairy, <laughs> which is um, an absolute fantastic title, I think, was on his deathbed and as a, as a gift to him, um, the coat of arms was created by dipping fingers into his own blood. And this of course is how, this is the legend of how the, the four red stripes on the, white, on the yellow background was created. And I think you'll agree, there's an incredible striking similarity there. In fact, 
for explaining the fingers, this other kind of model, which we could call, instead of the French flag model, the Catalan flag model, um, is probably correct. This explains why you can get many fingers, but you can't get many arms. So the French flag model positional information does occur in many cases, and this occurs in many cases as well. What we know about the main body is that this is defined not by a kind of repeated Turing type, Catalan flag type thing, it's defined like by a French flag. What that means is that you define one region where you can have your arms, like the white region, and it will only be one region, you can only have one pair of arms. That is the difference with the fingers, where you can relatively easily accidentally have seven fingers or eight fingers. So I would just like to thank um, all the people in my lab, the institute where we're doing this work, which is a fantastic place. And I would like to thank the, the collaborators from the lab of Marianne Ross in Santander and uh, a couple of other collaborators here, and our funding from various sources as well. So thank you very much for your attention.